welcome to another video. Today we're going to be discussing how an actor can develop character. It's not as simple as you might think for an actor to present a natural looking character on screen or on stage. It's just not. <laughs> Sounds like it might be. But it's not. People are often multifaceted, with contrasting inners and outers that change according to context, situation, external circumstances, and most often people don't actually see themselves the way other people do. So, naturally, recreating or representing a certain character is going to be difficult if you are comparing being that character with how you perceive that character. How can you be something in the same way as you perceive it. It's just difficult to comprehend, let alone do. <laughs> anyway, the book I'm going to be following in this session is D. Cannon's In-Depth Acting. I'm using it as a starting point and I will be referring to other literature to either elaborate on the points in this book or basically if D. Cannon says something that reminds me of something similar that I've read elsewhere. Some of the things that she writes about are things that Stanislavski has already mentioned and Uta Hagen says some similar things as well. So I also have these. <laughs> um, anyway, without further ado, let's begin. I didn't really know what to call this section, so it's about being and not playing a character and it's about finding empathy so that you won't perform a cliched character. One of the most important things that Dee Cannon writes about when talking about developing a character or acting in general is that you need to strive towards being your character, not playing your character. Because otherwise you just risk portraying a bunch of one-dimensional, unrelatable cliches. For instance, no one knows how they come across most of the time. And no one thinks of themselves as a bunch of negative characteristics either, not usually. For example, take a typical villain character. No one considers themselves to be the villain. They've got their own motives and morals and perspectives that make them do what they do. They're only seen as the villain in the perceptions of everyone else watching the play or film. D. Cannon explains this better here. If you set out to play the villain, bitch, or overbearing mother, you're making a comment and judgement you might hear from other people watching the movie or play. You should never perceive your character as such. This reminds me of something Stanislavski says in An Act of Repairs. Never seek to be jealous, or to make love, or to suffer for its own sake. All such feelings are the result of something that has gone before. Of the thing that goes before, you should think as hard as you can. As for the result, it will produce itself. The false acting of passions or of types, or the mere use of conventional gestures, these are all frequent faults in our profession. But you must keep away from these unrealities. You must not copy passions or copy types. You must live in the passions and in the types. Your acting of them must grow out of your living in them. Be the character, don't play the character. Be the character, don't play the character. I was playing just then. Be the character, don't play the character. It's just hard, especially when you're an actor because you know everybody's watching you and the whole point is to not have people watching you but you're becoming an actor in order to be watched. It's like, it's a contradiction. Anyway, so as actors, how do we make sure that we don't present a one-dimensional cliched character? Well, in Respect for Acting, Uta Hagen writes, When I confront the character I'm going to play, I must ask myself, who am I? I must begin organically by finding a change of address and a new autobiography. If I ask myself, who is she? And where was she born? I might end up with a brilliant treatise and someone possibly more removed from me than when I began. Rather than closing the gap between myself and the character, I may have created an abyss. The difference between the she and the I is crucial. So by bringing yourself to the character, you're going to avoid presenting a cliché, aren't you? You'll naturally have empathy for the character if you see them as you rather than an other, logically speaking. As D. Cannon explains, you must have empathy for your character and be able to fully justify your actions. The only way you'll avoid playing a cliché is to know who your character is and to develop empathy so that you can transform, in other words, own your character by living your character. <laughs> the notion of finding empathy for a character in order to avoid presenting a cliché it's an interesting one actually, and it reminds me of how Stanislavski said that to portray a character one must avoid prejudice. In this book here, Stanislavski writes that 
one of the most dangerous obstacles to the receiving of pure and fresh impressions is any kind of prejudice. Prejudice is created by the opinions that others foist upon us. Another's opinion can distort a naturally established relationship of an actor's emotions toward his new part. Therefore, during his first acquaintance with a play, an actor should try not to come under outside influences that might create a prejudice and throw his own first impressions, as well as his will, his mind and his imagination, out of line. So if we go back to the De Canon quote, the one that says if you set out to play the villain and so on, you're making a comment and judgement you might hear from other people watching the movie or the play. You're just adhering to the image of it, aren't you? You're not being the character, you're the image of that character. And it's not natural at all. It reminds me of Heidegger's The Origin of the Work of Art, but no, we won't get into that now. Just briefly, right, basically, so there's a painting of some shoes, some peasant shoes, and you look at the painting and you think, that's a beautiful artistic painting, Van Gogh's painting of some peasant shoes, and you think, wow, look at the artistry, look at all this. But then, if you think about it, the peasant who wore those shoes, what do they see? Well, they get up every day, they do the farming and all that, they put on the shoes. They don't go, oh, these shoes represent the farming and agriculture, and you can see how hard this peasant has worked. No, they just get up, put the shoes on and do the work. It's just a means to an end. It's just a tool to them. They don't even think about it. They just be. And that's the whole point. When we look at a painting, we see this other form of life. The peasant just lives their life. So they are being. And the phrase the being of being conceals being is quite relevant here. I did kind of just whiz through that, but it's the same principle, I think. If you just play an image of something, you're not playing the thing itself, you're playing the way it looks. You're adhering to the painting of the thing, you're not adhering to the thing itself. So if you play the cliched villain, you're adhering to the image of the villain, you're not really getting into the mindset of a villain, who is a human being, essentially. Be natural. That's if you want to act natural, by the way. Ooh, that was rambly. So, as I was saying, the dear canon quote, to go back to this, if you set out to play the villain and so on, you're actually just making a comment and judgement you might hear from other people watching the movie or the play. This is the same as being prejudiced about certain characteristics that a character may or may not have, right? You're not just being a character and justifying your actions, but you're playing a set of cliches, and that is prejudice. Like Dee Cannon writes, that you must have empathy for your character and be able to fully justify your actions. Stanislavski writes... Let an actor remember that his own opinion is better than that of an outsider, better even than an excellent one, if only because another's opinion can only add to his thoughts without appealing to his emotions. Here we've also got this relationship between theory and practice. Don't become too set on the theory, acting is a practice after all, and yes, the two have to inform one another in a dialectical relationship. Watch my series on dialectics that is coming out at the same time as these videos. Don't get it all up in your head. Don't intellectualise it too much. You are to play it and to feel it and to be it. The two things have to coincide and work. And if you just work with the thoughts, you're going to apply the characteristics of the character via the thought. And it's going to be very theoretical. Stanislavski here is saying, trust your instincts basically and don't worry about what others say things should be. How do you feel it should be? Because if you feel it, it's going to look natural doesn't matter if someone thinks it should be different. It might not look natural if you apply those thoughts. You know what I'm saying? Opinions can only add to your thoughts without appealing to your emotions, which are essentially in acting. Right. D. Cannon writes that human beings are made up of inner and outer characteristics. She defines characteristics as a feature or quality belonging typically to a person, place or thing and serving to identify it. She provides an example of a list of outer characteristics a character might have and says if this were all a character were about then they'd be one one-dimensional character and a caricature. Often for every outer characteristic there's a contrasting inner characteristic. So for instance if your outer characteristic is secure you might have an inner characteristic that is insecure. Outer might be open, your inner might be shy, your outer might be happy, your inner might be melancholic. Your outer might be kind and your inner might be kind, so sometimes the two are the same. Your outer might appear intelligent, but your inner could be thoughtful. You might appear confident on the outside, but be vulnerable on the inside. D. Cannon explains that often the inner characteristics contrast with the outer characteristics, and it's this contrast between the character's inner and outer that gives them depth and makes them appear three-dimensional. This isn't to say that you can't be the same on the inside as the outside, as D. Cannon explains. A person can be kind on the outside and kind on the inside. However, she also explains that the more opposites you can find, the more interesting and diverse this makes you as a person and as a character. Contrasts. Let the inner characteristics justify the outer characteristics. 
Stanislavski talks about inner and outer in his book, An Actor Prepares. However, in this instance, he's talking about how all action has to be justified by an inner. He writes that the external immobility of a person sitting on the stage does not imply passiveness. You may sit without emotion and at the same time be in full action. Nor is that all. Frequent physical immobility is the direct result of inner intensity, and it is these inner activities that are far more important artistically. The essence of art is not in its external forms, but in its spiritual content. In this instance, he's expressing the importance of not portraying a stereotypical one-dimensional character by making sure you have an inner justification for your outer actions that is engaged. He explains this simply here. All action in the theatre must have an inner justification, be logical, coherent and real. And as we've already established, that inner characteristic doesn't have to match exactly with the outer characteristic. For instance, that someone might appear loud and argumentative and maybe even confident on the outside, but only because on the inside they are scared and not wanting to appear weak to other people, as an example. In this instance, both the inner and outer characteristics are contrasting, but at the same time, the inner characteristic, the fear, is the reason and justification for the outer characteristic, the brave front. So inner and outer can be opposite, but they still have to justify each other. They can't just be completely disparate. And to be fair, if you were to portray an inner and an outer and they were seemingly disparate at first, I think by nature of you just being one human being, having to work with an inner and outer, they would end up coinciding anyway. I guess this is just something to be aware of. <laughs> this is how people are in real life. And this is how we as actors can portray natural, realistic looking characters in our performances. I'm confident inside and I'm awkward outside. Another tip for developing a character that Dee Cannon mentions in this book is to thoroughly understand your own characteristics before you start embodying those of another character. Dee Cannon writes that it's quite a good exercise to write down your own characteristics before you tackle your characters. Think of it as a list in progress. As we are ever evolving humans, learning, growing and developing all the time, so should your list. The more you know about yourself, the better actor you will be. The list needs to be as objective as possible. I must admit, I've inadvertently assessed my own inherent character a lot since I started studying acting. It's just what you end up doing. I think it's natural for an actor to do this. They're constantly trying to understand the workings of a person, other people, so that they can adequately represent them in a performance. And so it makes sense to wonder how you yourself come across to other people. I've always felt like I didn't have a personality and so assessing my own nature has been a constant thinking point for me. It's probably one of the reasons I became an actor. Dee Cannon explains that compiling a list of inner and outer characteristics is harder to do than compiling one for your own personal characteristics. Oh, okay. This is because the only thing you have to go on where your character is concerned is the play or screenplay. That makes sense. So it's harder to compile a list of characteristics for your character because you don't really know them. <laughs> You've only got the screenplay to go on. So, of course, the script has to be your first port of call. However, just because your character has an emotional breakdown, let's say, or turns aggressive, doesn't mean that these translate into workable characteristics. Dee Cannon describes this as circumstantial situations. These are situations that influence how your character behaves and might not adequately reflect the essence of your character's nature. Dee Cannon writes that just because you broke down or get angry, it doesn't mean that that's the type of person you are. Circumstance played a part in this, so you have to be able to separate circumstantial situations from the actual makeup of your character. While I do see what Dee Cannon is saying here, I do think that observing how your own character reacts to a certain situation, whether they have an emotional breakdown or not, can give insight into the natural makeup of the character you're trying to portray. For instance, if somebody breaks down in a situation, that's just the sort of person they are, they would break down in that situation. If someone stays strong in that situation, and you know they're a bit more resilient, maybe they hide their emotions a bit more. I guess Dee Cannon's point here is to be critically aware of the differences between reactions and personality. Just because a person acts upset in a situation that calls for that level of upset doesn't mean that they're an upset person generally. The crucial thing here is to distinguish between reactions and nature. The way a character reacts will tell you a lot about their nature, but the reactions themselves shouldn't be treated as defining characteristics for their personality or nature in and of themselves. Yes, that makes more sense. Parallels can be drawn between D. Cannon's circumstantial situations and Stanislavski's given circumstances, which he explains as follows. 
Given circumstances means the story of the play, its facts, events, epoch, time and place or action, conditions of life, the actor's interpretation, the mise-en-scene, the production, the sets, the costumes, properties, lighting and sound effects. All the circumstances that are given to an actor to take into account as he creates his role. There's lots of talk about where Stanislavski is concerned, so I'll do another video on him. But for now, I am just highlighting a comparison between some of the theories the canon mentions with Stanislavski's approach to acting, just so we can better situate this perspective on acting in relation to a history of literature and acting, if that makes sense. D. Cannon writes that when you're reading a script you have to be a bit of a detective and not only look at what happens to the character in the play but how you imagine that character to be when you don't see them, i.e. when they go off stage or off camera. You need to think of them outside of those two hours in the play or film. What are they like then? If we're saying that a good play or film is based around something heightened that often occurs in the space of a few hours, what are they like on a normal day when the cops haven't been called in or they haven't been proposed to? What then? You need to look at the nature of the person rather than their reaction to events and this will help in piecing the character together. This makes me think of how Stanislavski writes that a play and its roles have many planes along which their life flows. First there is the external plane of facts, events, plot, for this is contiguous with the plane of social situation, subdivided into class, nationality and historic setting. There is a literary plane with its ideas, its style and other aspects. There is an aesthetic plane with the sublays of all that is theatrical, artistic, having to do with scenery and production. There is the psychological plane of inner action, feelings, inner characterization, and the physical plane with its fundamental laws of physical nature, physical objectives and actions, external characterization. And finally, there is the plane of personal creative feelings belonging to the actor. But you see here as well, he also does talk about the inner and the outer. I'll just highlight that bit again. He says there is a psychological plane of inner action, feelings, inner characterization, and then there's the physical plane with its fundamental laws of physical nature, physical objectives and actions, external characterization. So he said it first. We all know he said it first. This isn't a competition. People are multifaceted. In this book, D. Cannon points out that people are multifaceted and a common error that an actor makes is that they try to demonstrate the whole character in one fell swoop in their performance. As Cannon writes, this is impossible to do just as it is in real life. Nobody in real life presents every aspect of their character all at once. D. Cannon writes that, take a first meeting with someone you haven't met before. I guarantee, within the first few minutes, you would have gleaned their essence and decided this is a very sweet person, or very gently, insecure, confident, intense, intellectual, witty. It doesn't mean to say that the person doesn't have other facets to their personality, it just means those other qualities are lying dormant until they're with someone who they do have a history with, like their mother, boyfriend, girlfriend or work colleague. The characteristics dominant now might be playful, emotional, immature, vulnerable, jealous or irritable. It doesn't mean you're a different person, it just means we use different sides of ourselves depending on our relationship dynamics we have with the people around us. As actors, we have to work out the whole of the character first rather than just select a few characteristics that are strikingly obvious and might even be cliché. So I think the main takeaway point from this is that you have to keep in mind your character's context and how they would be behaving in that particular moment. What facet of their personality would be coming through in their current context or situation? Circumstantial situations, as D. Cannon says, or given circumstances, as Stanislavski says, and I'm sure Uta Hagen calls it something else. It's like when Stanislavski says that you have all these different planes or elements of the play, and that not all of these planes are of equal significance, nor are all of these planes immediately accessible. Many of them have to be searched out one by one. Now for some much needed takeaway points from this lesson so that we know what we're talking about. In this video we've looked at how you should aim to be a character and not play it. An actor shouldn't aim to demonstrate the characteristics but should aim to embody them and own them. A good way to do this is, as D. Cannon suggests, have empathy for your character. So that even if they're a bad character like the villain they don't become a bunch of cliches. You can gain empathy for your character if you totally embody your character and think of them in terms of I and not she or he. Think of them in terms of I and me pronouns and not she or he pronouns or they. This latter tip is something that Uta Hagen explains in her book Respect for Acting. Relatedly, 
Stanislavski says, don't be prejudiced in your interpretation of a character. Base your interpretations on emotions and not thoughts. Because only in this way can things feel and appear more organic. And I am adding here, that's not to say that you should negate thought completely. The two, emotion and thought, theory and practice, should work together dialectically. If things are influenced by preconceived ideas or other people's theories and not emotive and in the moment, they're more likely to appear, or they're more likely going to be prejudiced, aren't they? Another thing to consider is that your character has a bunch of inner and outer characteristics and not all of these characteristics are going to be revealed all at once. Various characteristics will emerge at various times and in various contexts and situations. You have to be aware of your character's circumstances, the context. D. Cannon calls this circumstantial situations. And you could compare this with Ute Hagen's immediate previous circumstances and Stanislavski's given circumstances. To portray a character like they're a real life person, the actor has to embody something multifaceted and very much living in the moment or living in the situations presented by the narrative. People are complicated. Acting's not easy. It requires a lot of people watching, studying, introspection, thought, feeling, awareness, self-awareness. Know yourself. Know how people work. At least. I guess you just have to stop thinking and just be. But as actors it's difficult to do that, especially if you're an academic. You can't really study yourself doing it either. You can't know when you've done it right, you just have to feel it. Because the moment you start analysing the situation, you've already lost it. I guess I could go on talking about this forever, so I'll stop here now. Stay tuned for more videos on this topic. I'll watch my videos on dialectics. <laughs> Bye for now.